Welcome to Right on the Money, the weekly talk show with interviews you can use to help you maximize your money and optimize your financial future. Before moving forward with any of the ideas discussed on the show, always consult your financial advisor, insurance professional, or tax consultant. Looking for financial help or a second opinion? We can help you in your search. And now, your host of Right on the Money, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator, Steve Savant. Well, Happy New Year, everyone, and we're all making our New Year's resolutions, and the number one New Year's resolution for 2016 is getting out of debt by going on a spending diet. And here to help us manage down our debt is nationally recognized retirement speaker and best-selling author, Tom Hagna. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks, Steve. Great to be with you. Tom, I loved your book, Don't Worry, Retire Happy. I saw your PBS special. It was awesome. But before I get into my consumer debt, before I get into the st- my own state that I live in, Arizona's debt and whatever else state you're broadcasting from, and our United States U.S. debt, talk about the global debt. I'm talking about worldwide. Give me a little idea of what we're looking at. Yeah, so look, I've uh, had economic commentaries here now in 2012, 13, 14, 15, and I've been pretty close to being right on the money, as we say, oh, uh, with, with what the economy's doing. And now, you know, it's timely because the Federal Reserve just uh, raised interest rates the other day for the first time in, in almost a decade. And a lot of people think interest rates are going up. And I'm here to tell you, I don't believe interest rates are going to go up much, all right, for a very, very long time. Let's, let's first understand that the Fed doesn't set interest rates. The Fed sets overnight rates. They do not set the overall rates. So, mm-hmm. you know, when I talk about the economy, and, and I'll get into the global debt in just mm-hmm. a second, but I often ask people, you know, are you more concerned about deflation or inflation? A lot of people say they're more concerned about inflation. Mm-hmm. And if you really look at why, if we take a look at the money supply in this country, you know, the Federal Reserve has printed about $4 trillion of money over the last few years. And Remember what happens. Every time you print a dollar, the value of all the other dollars goes down. And so when you print this amount of money, you'd think that the value of the dollar would go down. And then when you go to buy something, it would take more money. That's called inflation. But that really hasn't happened. And the reason it hasn't happened is because there's two components to the inflation equation. The first component is the supply of money, which has gone up like nothing we've ever seen. And in normal times, that would not just be inflation. That'd be hyperinflation. That's what most people are seeing. But there's a second component. And that second component is called the velocity of money. It's how fast money turns over in the economy. And just like the supply of money has gone up like nothing we've ever seen, the velocity of money has gone down like nothing we've ever seen. There's no money velocity. So it's like we printed $4 trillion and we dug a big hole and we buried it. I can't even understand why we did that. But now interest rates have been low for a long time. We only had a quarter point raise in the Fed. I don't know how it's going to be. It's going to affect mortgages. It's going to affect car loans. Uh, credit card, but maybe. really, maybe not that much. Maybe, because see, the Fed sets the overnight lending rate. Now, mm-hmm. traditionally, rates go up in concert so that you'd think if they raise it 25, everything else mm-hmm. would go up 25, but that's not always true. Sometimes the yield curve flattens mm-hmm. where the longer term rates actually come down, or as it goes up, they stay the same. That's called a flattening of the yield curve. There's even times when it does inverted yield curve mm-hmm. where the short term rates are higher than the long term rates, and that typically portends a, a recession or something. But so, look, we're not not going to see any inflation until we see this money velocity pick up. But mm-hmm. besides that, there are several huge deflationary pressures that I've been talking about for the last four years that haven't gone away. And mm-hmm. the first thing is debt, like we talked about, record global government debt. There's over $57 trillion of government debt. Our country is 18 going on $19 trillion in debt with almost $100 trillion of unfunded obligations. Now, what I always ask people is, what is debt? All debt is is taking from the future and spending it today. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. We're in football season. So somebody got the red zone package. They want to watch all the the football games on the Mm -hmm. red zone package, but they got a crappy old TV. So they go down to Best Buy. They don't have any money in their pocket, but they got a credit card. And Best Buy is happy to swipe that credit card for $1,500. And guess what? You get to take a brand new big screen TV home. And you get to watch the red zone package in your brand new big screen TV. What did you just do? You took $1,500 of your future and you spent it today. Steve, what I'm telling you is governments around Mm -hmm. the world have taken $57 trillion of our future and it's gone. So what is that going to do to global growth for for the next decades? It's going to significantly reduce global growth. It's highly deflationary. 
Okay, so really right now, we're looking, you're saying it's gonna be pretty flat from an interest rate point of view. So we're not gonna get really big money from CDs, money markets. I mean, there's a, banks aren't gonna be going up for anytime soon. I don't see interest rates doing much of anything for a very, very long time. So the first thing is debt. But you know what? A lot of people have been in debt. They've had credit mm -hmm. card debt, they've had student loans. What happens when you pay off your debt? What aren't you doing with your money? you're not spending it or saving it. See, the paying off of debt is also very deflationary. At the government level, it's called deleveraging. And what mm -hmm. I'm telling you is governments around the world haven't even started to get out of debt. Now, how do governments get out of debt? There are three ways we only ever hear about two, raise taxes, cut spending. The third one is growth. Growth is the best, but we never hear about it. But what happens to an economy when you raise taxes and you cut spending? It strangles the economy. It's highly deflationary. Mm -hmm. So you got this massive debt that's deflationary. You got this deleveraging that hasn't even started. What I'm telling you is you can look forward to decades, decades of higher taxes and reduced government spending. Hasn't even started yet. Mm -hmm. And the third big D is demographics. We're getting old. Europe is old. Japan is very, very old. Steve, in Japan, they now sell more adult diapers and baby diapers. That's old. <laughs> China will get old before they get rich. Their one-child policy will come back to bite them. Well, when I'm thinking of how to combat this, I mean, I'm trying to say I'm just a little guy, and this effect of the world, the world's debt, is actually infringing on my lifestyle, and I don't even see it. Yeah, and the point here with the demographics is that old people don't spend money. Mm -hmm. So you got these 78 million baby boomers that, that, that it was about them and more and bigger and better, and they bought, 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 bought. Well, guess what? Those baby boomers are over the hill. They're over age 50. What happens at age 50? The kids move out, at least for a couple months, and your spending goes down every year after age 50. Now... There's some other things. Citibank says that there's a 65% probability of recession next year. There are other people who say it's even higher than that. You look around the world, Europe has negative interest rates, Steve. Hmm. Negative. You go to Switzerland, you put $100,000 in to buy a bond, guess what? You come back and you only get $98,000 out. You're not earning interest, you gotta mm -hmm. pay them interest. Mm -hmm. So think about this. We're raising interest when other countries have negative interest rates. What's that gonna do to the dollar? That's gonna drive the dollar up well, what does that do? It reduces our competitiveness. All the manufacturing people aren't going to buy our stuff. They're going to buy the Chinese stuff. They're going to buy the European stuff. And so that's mm -hmm. going to reduce global growth even more. So when the Fed raises interest rates in an overall, some places, negative interest rate environment, it's going to cause slowing down here. And I believe our rates are going to actually go down, not go up. Well, Tommy, on our next, our, our last raise was just about a week or so ago. Um, when I'm looking at the Fed doing that, I I, I saw the market was kind of happy about it overseas. Well, they were for the first for day, the first day, but yeah. the next two days they went down. Interest rates initially went up, and now guess what? Interest rates on the 10-year and the 30-year have gone down. It's it's working out. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't tell the day-to-day -day changes, mm -hmm. all right? But, but I do believe that all these pressures are going to mm -hmm. cause some problems. Now, there's a couple books out there, Steve, that the, that the audience might want to read. The one on the left is called The Death of Money by Jim Rickards, and the one on the right is called The Demographic Cliff by Harry Dent. They both are predicting some pretty bad times, but mm -hmm. for very different reasons, okay? Jim Rickards has teamed up with Porter Stansberry and, and Ron Paul and mm -hmm. some of these, and they say that we're going to have hyperinflation, that the dollar's going to lose its reserve currency status. I don't believe that to be true, and I'll tell you why. Because whenever something bad happens over here, guess what? The dollar goes up. People come to us. We are mm -hmm. still the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. So could we lose the reserve currency status at some time? Yes, we could. But is it imminent? They've been saying for five years it's going to happen imminently. Well, it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen imminently. We're, we're not going to start using the euro. We're not going to start using Russian rubles or the Chinese renminbi. We're not all going to carry gold in our pocket and shave off a little to buy some bread. Mm -hmm. I do not see that happening. And Harry Dent is all about the, the debt, the demographics, the deleveraging. That is, we're going to face deflationary pressures, not inflationary pressures. And I will tell you, I'm solidly on Harry Dent's side on this one. I believe he's got the right thing. So, you know, to summarize it, are we going to have inflation? We could. We printed a lot of money. If we saw some money velocity, we could see some inflation. Are we going to see deflation? We could. Look at all these deflationary pressures. But Steve, I can't predict the future better than anybody else. So mm -hmm. here's what I tell people. Watch the bond market. The bond market predicts the future every single day. Well, if you look at the 30-year U.S. government bond, it's paying less than 3%. What is that predicting? The odds of any inflation or hyperinflation in this country are almost nothing. Mm -hmm. The 30-year the, the bond is telling you that interest rates are likely to stay low for a very, 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 very long time. Now, Tom, when you say that, I mean, am I saying in my lifetime 
maybe then over the next 30 years, I'm not going to see 6% ever again. I t- you can't see 6%. If we saw 6% on, a, on $18 trillion of debt, that'd be over a trillion dollars a year just in interest. We would go into a Great Depression, and what happens in a Great Depression? Mm-hmm. Interest rates drop, they go negative. So Ben Bernanke says you're not going to see 4% for the rest of your life. I doubt you'll ever see 3% for the rest of your life. But again, I can't predict the future. What I'm telling you mm-hmm. is the 30-year U.S. government bond is predicting that interest rates are going to stay very, 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 very low for a very, very, very long time. And I'm right on board with that. And I do. I don't care what the Fed does with their overnight rates. It's not going to affect most interest rates for a very long time. Well, I'm thinking about how we're going to combat this. And you've given us two ways. It could be inflation. It could be deflation. But that's the worldview, right? That's just the global view at large. Remember, if you're listening to our show on the radio, iTunes, or podcast, you can view our radio, our video version on rightonthemoneyshow.com and request information from this segment. In our next segment, we're going to talk about America's federal and state debt with Tom Hagman. We'll be right back after the break. The number one fear of American seniors is outliving their money in retirement. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. The Guinness Book of World Records for Living the Longest is held by Gene Kalman, who lived 122 years, 164 days. And that's a fact. But it seems like science fiction to consider living to age 150. But according to a leading gerontologist, that person has already been born. Every day in America, seniors are turning age 100. It's the fastest growing segment among retirees today. And tomorrow, you may very well be one of them. Could your retirement plan go beyond age 90, age 95, or even age 100? Now you can purchase guaranteed lifetime income no matter how long you live. And that income can also include annual increases to help maintain the purchasing power of your retirement dollar. So just go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the free income calculator to determine how much guaranteed lifetime income you can purchase. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money and Happy New Year to you and yours. And I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about America's federal and state debt with Tom Hagna, nationally recognized retirement speaker and best-selling author. Tom, uh, last segment, we talked about the worldview. Now we're talking about the U.S. and state debt. Uh, there's some colossal numbers here. And I don't see We just cut another deal. The, the Congress and the president, they're all happy. They seem to be happy. We just added more debt. We just had another tax. We had some tax increases. They, they thought they were going to go ahead and, I'm sorry, spending. We had right. spending increases and tax reductions. I don't know how we can do this and keep adding on to the deficit. It's it's terrible. It really is. And and when you go to the debtclock.org, I mean, when you when you have this live, this thing spinning all the time, and you can just watch this debt increasing, it's it's really um, somewhat depressing if you go there and look at the uh, numbers. Honestly, I think it's like thirty five to thirty eight thousand a second. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, yeah, and we're going into debt, you know, a couple billion every single day, oh. two to three billion every single day. I mean, it's oh. crazy. So, I mean, if we break this down, our national debt is now over $18 trillion. Now, Steve, what I say is this should be a national crisis, but you know why it's not? Because most people don't know what a trillion dollars is. So let me try to put it this way. If $1 equals one second, $1 million equals 11 and a half days, $1 billion equals 32 years, one trillion dollars equals thirty-two thousand years. Thirty-two thousand years at one dollar equals one second, and we are eighteen trillion in the hole with with about a hundred trillion of unfunded obligations. This is serious business. Well, when I look at my tab for this, I mean, I, I want to break this down for a second, Tom. I notice that per citizen, at least today, at the time we're recording, is of a little over fifty-eight thousand dollars for every single what do we have? Three hundred twenty-two million, million people. people in the United yeah. States. For- for so, each taxpayer, it's one hundred fifty-seven thousand. Well, wait a minute. That, see, this is what bothers me. I know everybody's paying Social Security, FICA, FUTA, SUTA. Everybody's doing it comes out of our checks. Right. But only half the country is paying actual federal tax. Right. So us who are paying taxes, we don't owe fifty-eight thousand. That's per citizen. We owe one hundred and fifty-seven thousand. When are you going to send yours in? Uh, hopefully, <laughs> I'll die before that. <laughs> Look, I mean, it, it, and it's and it's uh, these are big numbers really up here. Numbers. You know, the the U.S. total debt of, of sixty four trillion, and I mean that that includes all kinds of other debt. You know, the, your corporate debt, your credit cards, your everything. I mean, look at the total debt per citizen is 199,000 total debt per family 788,000 when are you sending it in yeah i'm looking at the actual us federal revenue at 3.2 trillion and i'm sitting over here with a federal us spending of 3.7 so i'm short about 
half a trill, right? And that's being added on to the budget. I don't Plus know how interest. We're gonna... Plus interest. And, you know, you go into here and you look at the state debt, the local mm. debt. It's not just a federal thing. This is a big deal. And what's very interesting is you can find out all kinds of things at debtclock.org. You know, what's the population? How many taxpayers? What's the workforce? How many are actually employed? Mm -hmm. There's some very good information here, Steve. Um, you've got mortgage debt, personal debt, student loan debt, credit card debt. This debt thing is is a big deal. Well, I'm looking at the personal debt per citizen. So when you're looking at 53, it sounds that doesn't sound too bad, 53,000, but it's really not that number. No, it's not. And you go up here, total debt per family, $788,000, you know. And because they want us to pay their debt, too, the, the federal government, the state government. I mean, that's just what we're talking about. Yeah, and then you've got, you know, the budget deficit. You've got Social Security liability, Medicare liability, unfunded obligations of $100 trillion, liability per taxpayer, $840,000. No, I, I, I guess I'm saying the federal government is not really a good model example of how to run your family economics. No, I mean, look, if any if any business ran their business this way, they they get the, the leaders would get put in jail. I mean, if if you were running your own personal situation like this, you'd be declaring bankruptcy. I mean, but this tells how many retirees there are, how many people are disabled, how many veterans, how many people in the military. It's just a great source to get all kinds of information. Mm -hmm. There's another great source, uh, Steve, and that's the Truth in Accounting website. And here you can dig into the state. So, like, you can pick out your state mm -hmm. and you can find out everything you ever wanted to know about your state. I, I noticed that there are two types of states. There are these good states, right, and bad states. Now, so we're talking about the federal government. Now we're drilling down to your state, and you'll have to go out to truthinaccounting.org so that you can pick it out and see what you want to see your specific state. When I'm looking at the top five really good states they call them the sunshine states steve oh, I, I love that. you got alaska which isn't in debt there's a surplus of fifty-two thousand per person in alaska north dakota they were big in oil now that's going to be changing but at least at least they didn't spend it yeah, right by, by the way a little side note there tommy it's, it looks like alaska is gonna for the first time start looking at tax a state income tax yeah they're just starting to look at that now well because but look alaska north dakota wyoming you're, you're looking at three big oil states and now mm -hmm. oil prices are way down mm -hmm. and they're likely to stay down for a very long time because of all this excess supply mm -hmm. from fracking and so but thank goodness those states did not go out and spend all their money in the good mm -hmm. times they actually saved it and they have a surplus and wyoming has a surplus utah has a surplus south dakota has now, a Tommy, surplus i just want to say something every one of these states has got serious winter yeah, they do. I mean, think about this. I mean, I, people say, I'm going to Alaska. It's got a 50, th well, yeah, but it's Alaska. And I don't want to bring politics into yeah. it, Steve, but those are all Republican states. I oh, will okay. have you notice with surpluses, okay, all right? They're red states at all. Yeah. <laughs> now let's go to the, 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 the sinkhole states. These are states that are in pretty big trouble. New Jersey has a burden of 52,000 per person. Uh, Connecticut, 48,000 per person. Illinois, I mean, Illinois has got all kinds of problems. Uh, 45,000 per person. Kentucky, 32,000. And Massachusetts, 27,000. How are we going to rein this in? I mean, you know, you're looking at the math. The politics is getting in the way. We can't really do the right thing. It would be harmful to the economy if we tried to start paying down this debt. Yeah. How do these, I mean, certain states are just going to attract people and certain states, people are going to be leaving. Yeah, because when you're in debt, what do you have to do? They're going to raise the taxes. Well, when people get their taxes raised, guess what they say? Mm -hmm. You know what, Florida, Texas look pretty good. They don't have any state income tax. Mm -hmm. And so to tax their way out is going to, we've got to get budget discipline. Mm -hmm. Look, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, shouldn't matter. We should mm -hmm. all agree you can only spend what you take in. Isn't mm -hmm. that a good deal? Whether you're Democrat or Republican, you, you got you to live within your budget. Now, we could say how we're going to spend the money differently, mm -hmm. Republican or Democrat, but we, shouldn't we both say that no matter what, we shouldn't spend more than what we have? Mm -hmm. That should be just a that should just be a bedrock thing, and that could solve a lot of problems. Now, uh, everybody, you know, most citizens, consumers, pub, the public, we have to do that. We have to do that. Any business has to do that. The government should have to do that as well. Now, if there's extreme emergencies like market crashes mm -hmm. or wars, there may be times when you have mm -hmm. to violate that. But in normal, peaceful times, you, you we should stick to that. Okay, I'm thinking of this old phrase uh, from uh, it's attributed to Bill Oral. I don't know if it's true. It says, "If your outgo exceeds your income." then your upkeep will be your downfall. Well, look, somebody's going to pay the piper. You cannot keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing mm -hmm. without any consequence. There will be consequences, and it will be bad. And you know what's going to hurt? It's going to hurt the, the poorest among us mm -hmm. are going to get hurt the most.
And look what's happening in Greece. Mm -hmm. Look what's happening in Greece. It, the rich people are, are, they leave. They're okay. Mm -hmm. It's the poor people that get hurt. Mm -hmm. And so spending too much money does not help poor people. It never has and it never will. Well, I've even seen some countries that were used as probably this great trophy of liberalism from a political point of view. And now Denmark's even thinking, well, we got to kind of start pulling things yeah. back. There are more conservative governments coming online. We're going to see some real changes in the earth. I mean, I think the world has to really come up. I mean, that first segment, we said, how much was it? 57 trillion worldwide. Wor worldwide government debt. So when we're looking at the United States, and of course, you know, we're in an election year coming up here. You know, it's, it's, we're talking 10 months out. Any, I think any candidate that doesn't talk about dealing with the debt if you're under 50 years of age, that person should not be on your docket. Right. And and look, we don't have to pay the debt off tomorrow, Steve. Here's mm -hmm. the deal. What if right now our debt's going like this, two to three billion every day. What if we just leveled it off and mm -hmm. put it on a 50 or 60 year glide path? We don't have to pay it off mm -hmm. in five years or 10 years. Put it on a 50 or 60 year glide path, but just get it in the right direction. It is going the wrong direction right at a time when mm -hmm. 78 million baby boomers are reaching retirement where they're not going to be earning, mm -hmm. they're not going to be paying taxes, they're going to be collecting benefits. This is bad. It's only going to get worse. And we need leaders to step up to the plate and and I acknowledge it. Tom, let's say you're the president of the United States before we close out the segment. How would I fix this? Well, I think you got to you got to do some type of balance, balanced budget, okay? And like I said, we don't have to pay it off tomorrow. We just got to stop the growth. We got to level it off and we got to put it on a glide mm -hmm. path. It could be a long glide path. We're a very mm -hmm. wealthy country. We we have a lot of good things going for us, but we cannot continue this. It's unsustainable mm -hmm. right at a time when we got record numbers of people retiring. Well, remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, or a podcast, you can view the video version online at rightonthemoneyshow.com and request information from this specific segment. And remember, in our third segment, we're going to talk about good debt and bad debt with Tom Hagen. I didn't know there was such a thing. We'll be right back with more from Tommy. The Guinness Book of World Records for Living the Longest is held by Gene Kalman who lived 122 years, 164 days. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. Will you live to be a super centenarian like Gene? Of course, no one knows how long they're gonna live or if their family history will be any indication of their lifespan, especially in light of constant medical advancements. But the odds are ever increasing that a significant segment of seniors may live to age 100. But without some idea of your life expectancy, it's difficult to make plans for the future, especially for retirement. While there's no exact science in computing how long you live, you can get an idea by taking a life expectancy test. Then you can use the results to create a timeline for your own retirement plan. And don't forget, when you take the life expectancy test, always answer the questions honestly. So go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the free life expectancy calculator and get an idea if you're really ready for retirement. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money and Happy New Year to you and yours. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial economist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about good debt and bad debt with Tom Hagnan, nationally recognized retirement speaker and best-selling author, Paychecks and Playtex, and your other book, which I really like, Don't Worry, Retire Happy, which is a PBS special, and it's still on television. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a real Shakespearean guy. I don't wake up at night and want to read the King James version of what they were doing back in England 400 years ago. Right. But I love this line. He goes, neither, this is Will, Bill Shakespeare saying, neither a borrower or a lender be for loan doth off lose both itself and friend. I love that line. And then the other one is, if you can't spend your way out of a recession or borrow your way out of debt, you can't. You just cannot spend your way out. You agree right. with that? I agree. And I, I think if most people followed those, they'd be better off. Okay. So this discussion about good debt or bad, bad debt, I don't know if there is good debt. Okay. And so let's say maybe there's better debt and worse debt. Well, let me okay? stop you there because I heard a lot of financial advisors, a lot of color commentators out there saying, well, a mortgage is a good debt. Yeah. Well, look, a mortgage would fit into the better type of debt. Like if you're going to be okay. in debt. Okay. So I can't get you to say good. You're just saying better. Well, look, um, I've had debt. I, mm -hmm. I, I've had a mortgage and I, you know, so I think when you use debt properly, if you mm -hmm. understand how to use mm -hmm. debt properly, where you don't get over your head, where you keep it very manageable, if you're taking debt for appreciating assets. Mm -hmm. So Homes, typically, although not always in Arizona, but yeah. homes historically have gone up over time. Real estate mm -hmm. has gone up over time. Um, things that, that appreciate 
are examples of maybe better debt. But again, you don't want to get so far out of debt that your debt payment is more than your income. And so you've got to be very careful. Um, debt can be okay if you manage it properly, mm -hmm. if you use it wisely. You know, um, some examples, mortgages, business loans, like think of all the people who had never been able to start Microsoft or any of these, Apple. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to take some debt on their credit card to start these things, right? And so um, there are times when if you use debt wisely that you can put yourself into situations where um, things can go up in mm -hmm. value. It can create value, okay? But then think about this. Most small businesses fail. So if they took all this debt to start a business and then it failed, many people get just um, wiped out by, mm. by, by going too far into debt. Okay, now one of the reasons we're talking about good debt and bad debt in this segment is because we know people do want to save. They do want to have a good retirement. But we have to take clear the deck with something. Maybe we can't pay our debts all off and then start. Maybe we got to do a little bit of both. Do a little bit of pay down on the bad debt, putting a little money aside. I don't think there's yin or yang, right or wrong here, but we need to start it. That's the whole point. Yeah, and I think we're going to talk about some of that in, in another section. Um, let me just say one thing about student loans. You know, a lot of people put student loans in good debt. I would say be very, very careful. We now have a problem with all these students who took out these huge student loans to get some degree that now they're working at Starbucks and they can't mm -hmm. even use their degree and they're in debt $100,000, $125,000. That was not a good mm -hmm. debt, okay? And so like with my kids, I've said I'm not going to pay for all their college but I will make sure they get out of college without being in debt. Mm -hmm. That's what I'll do. But they've got to they've got to contribute. They've got to work. But I don't want my kids to be strapped mm -hmm. with all this this massive student loan debt. That, that is what's hurting a lot of the millennials today. Well, you know, time. There's a lot of politics involved in this now because they're talking about, hey, how are we going to help settle help, help these kids settle their debts? Well, we should have helped them not get into debt, right. okay? Right. And we should have said, hey, here's a here's a work program. Get an extra job. Do some of this. Maybe take a loan for the tuition or something. But I mm -hmm. mean, some of these people they go on four five years and they think it's party time for five years mm -hmm. on a loan and then they forget they got to pay this back so so that mm -hmm. can be that can be very difficult there's also some worse debt okay and that's debt to buy depreciating assets cars mm -hmm. go down in value mm -hmm. phones go down in value ipads go down in value you know uh, boats go down in value rvs go down in value furniture clothing travel none of those go up in value they all go down in value and you want to be very careful about ever using debt for things that go down in value mm -hmm. well that's a hard because you mean you name some things that are just lifestyle issues i have to have clothes i have to live in a yeah, i have, I have, have a to car. live in a place i have to have a Look, car I will tell you a little story. Like I've bought my cars for cash for the last 25 years. I haven't done a loan on a car since I was a second lieutenant in the army. And you want to know what? I now have a car payment. But the reason I did it was because I got interest rate at 1%. Mm -hmm. And for me, I have the money that I can pay it off. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like I was using it as debt. But I mean, mm -hmm. when I can get something at 1% and spread that thing out over a few years, I'm okay with that because I'm earning mm -hmm. better than 1% in my other uh, investments. And so uh, for me, it's the first time I've had a car payment in 30 mm -hmm. years. So again, I think it's I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth there, I don't think, because I've, I've got the adequate resources to mm -hmm. pay for cash. I'm choosing to use debt for my advantage because mm -hmm. I got a lower interest rate. But in general, it does mm -hmm. not make sense to take a lot of debt on depreciating assets. Okay, so, uh, you know, we want to have an appreciating asset. Actually, the only things I can think of is savings, you know, getting into the kind of investments and savings accounts that will secure my future. If I'm going to take a loan, like you've suggested on your house, one of the big things I can see is it's so low now, zero one percent sometimes cash is king and you want to be able to have in these times you know you don't know are you guaranteed a job right. maybe you need to have some cash and most planners talk about having 90 days i think we need to pull that out to about six months at least six months yeah. at least six months and cash is king and especially if we see a low interest rate deflationary type mm -hmm. environment which i believe that we're going to be in for a very long time cash is king and cash flow is king mm -hmm. all right but but let me just elaborate on this depreciating asset thing so let's say you you're, you're you take a loan on a car and traditionally rates were mm -hmm. seven five seven eight nine percent well what would happen is the value of the car is going down but the price you're paying for the car is going up because those interest rates keep, you know, you if you if you buy a car for, for ten thousand dollars and you're financing it at seven or eight percent, you're mm -hmm. gonna pay twenty or twenty five thousand by the time that car's done. You're not paying ten. But yet your car is worth less than the ten. And you're gonna be paying twenty thousand for a car that in five years is worth two thousand. Mm -hmm. And that's where it doesn't make any sense. And so, you know, be very careful with debt. Okay, and when we're talking about debt, and I'm thinking about you know, 
I like Ben Franklin on my currency rather than George Washington. Nothing wrong with the first president of the United States, but right. I think I like Benjamins better than George Washington. Right, hundred dollar bills versus one dollar. Well, bill. this is what Ben. This is what Ben. Wise Ben said. He said, "Rather go to bed supperless than to rise in the morning in debt." Think about that. Yeah. You'd rather deny yourself rather than go ahead and get into debt. Well, and that's one thing that I think baby boomers haven't done a great job of is they haven't mm -hmm. denied themselves. Mm -hmm. It's all about me and more and right now. And what I would say is save up until you can buy it for cash. Mm -hmm. Don't put everything on the credit card. If you're going to use debt, use it for your advantage, not so that it can take advantage of you. Of course, we just came out of the holiday season, and we had there's a lot of spending going on back then. Everybody's credit cards, their home equity loans, they're really tapped out. I noticed, I don't know who wrote this or quoted it, but I love it. It says, Christmas is the season when you buy this year's gifts with next year's money. Yeah. No, that's another way of putting it. I know. I just So, well, Tommy, our goal to talk about debt management in this is because Really, people can't save until we get a little bit of control of this. Right. So, And we do have tactical and strategic ways to save money, not only for other things like maybe buying a house, maybe your child's education, but big one, the retirement time, our golden years. Yeah, and we got to put money away. Look, there was a guy who said, most Americans would be millionaires except for two things. They spend too much on their cars and they get divorced. So the moral of the story, Steve, is drive a used car and stick with your first spouse, all right? <laughs> but look, I've driven used cars for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the last brand new car I bought for myself was when I was a second lieutenant right out of college. I was young. I was dumb. I bought mm -hmm. a brand new car. Even now, I can buy brand new cars, whatever I want for cash. I don't, all right? I buy a car with a, well, I, the one I just got a truck, and it had 12,000 or 11,000 miles on it. It was a, two years old. I got it for half price. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the way I buy my vehicles. And you think I live any less of a lifestyle? No. Mm -hmm. Most people are spending way too much on cars. Way too much on cars. Well, I'm looking at this quote from uh, James Bassford. He says, the man who has enough money to pay his debts, does not have enough money to pay his debts, has too much of everything else. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to give you kind of an idea. Tommy's giving you ideas like cash is king. I want to pay when I can, unless there's a screaming deal, like you said, on the on the car issue. Uh, we're trying to do this. Why are we trying to reduce our debt? Because we want to shift from reducing our debt, making payments to the credit card, our lease uh, vehicle, our mortgage, if we can. And I want to move over and start paying myself first. Right. And that's the big thing, Tommy. You we're gotta, not paying ourselves first. No, you, we're, we're at the end of the line. And when I was, you know, I used to be a financial advisor, and I tell people, look, you're standing at the end of the line, and you're paying everybody else. You're at the end of the line. Mm -hmm. My job is to move you to the front of the line. You got to pay yourself first. Well, remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, or a podcast, you can view the video version online at rightonthemoneyshow.com and request information on this very segment. In our fourth segment, we're going to talk about paying down debt and creating cash flow with Tom Hagna. We'll be right back after the break. Over 50% of those who have life insurance may be in the wrong rate class and more than likely are paying too much for their coverage. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. Sometimes you just need a second opinion to determine if you're actually getting the best deal. The insurance industry has just updated the mortality tables to reflect longer life expectancy, so premiums are expected to go down. And additionally, there are life insurance companies that are more benevolent if you have a medical problem than other companies. And when you consider that most life insurance companies offer lifestyle credits for those who practice good living habits, well, you could save a lot. But an additional value here is the vast majority of life insurance companies offer a free blood and urine analysis, a test that costs hundreds of dollars and with no obligation to buy. With hundreds of life insurance companies competing for your business, you could pay substantially less. So if you have a life insurance policy and you want a second opinion, just go to www.writeonthemoneyshow.com and click on the life insurance for a second opinion. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money and Happy New Year to you and yours. And I am Steve Savant, syndicated financial economist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about paying down debt and creating cash flow. There's a new one with Tommy Hegna, nationally recognized retirement speaker and best-selling author. And Tom, uh, that's the end game. We're talking about managing debt. I don't see the world doing this. I don't see our U.S. government or states doing this, but we have to do it. We for, have to. For yeah. our family. Absolutely. So I'm looking at this. Our president, Andrew Jackson, the $20 bill, right? I think that's the one they're trying yeah. to change, right? The cover of the, right. the He says, when you get in debt, you become a slave. You think that's too strong? 
No, well, I mean, look, it's like I said in the last segment, if you use debt wisely, but mm-hmm. most people do become slaves to debt because they, they, don't, they don't manage it. It's too mm-hmm. easy. It's too easy to spend it now. All you're doing is taking from your future and spending it today. And if you take all your future and you spend it today, what is your future going to be? It's going to mm-hmm. be much reduced. And they forget about the reduction of the future. They like spending it today. Well, think about it. We're talking about the I just told Andrew Jackson, President. how about President Thomas Jefferson? He said, never spend money before you have it. Right. Again, cash is king and you should pay cash for things. Don't use those credit cards. Those credit cards can, 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 you got to be very disciplined, very disciplined. I think when we talk, look about this, we're trying to come to a place where we don't become indentured servants to debt. That's really the bottom line. Right. And so our goal is we want our families to be prosperous. We want America to be prosperous. We do. And we just have to get a handle on our debt. Now, maybe it's going to be reversed. Maybe the consumer is going to show the way to the government at the state level and the federal level to show the way, the, be an example. And that's one of the goals. I mean, I saw one of Dave Ramsey's burning mortgages online. Right. I mean, getting out of debt. Can you imagine being four? The last one I saw, I think, was like 44 years old, and he doesn't have a mortgage anymore. Right. How happy is that family? Well, they're happy. I mean, I've I've not had a mortgage for quite a few years, and I'm happy about it. Um, you know, getting out of debt is is so important. Uh, look, there's some ways to get out of debt. Like, if mm. you're in debt, there's there's some different strategies. And you quoted Dave Ramsey and, you know, I, I say I, I agree with about 85% of what Dave Ramsey says, and I'm all for what he says about getting out of debt. Mm-hmm. He doesn't really understand some financial products fully, mm-hmm. but he does understand debt, all right, because I, I think he did mm-hmm. go bankrupt or he had he had financial problems. But look, there's a several strategies. So one of the strategies, Steve, is you start with the highest interest rate. So if you got five credit cards and one's paying 14, one's 15, 16, and you got two that are 21, you might want to start with those 21 mm-hmm. percenters and pay off the highest interest rate first. There's another strategy that says pay the smallest debt first. And you say, well, why would you want to do that? Well, because each of these come with a minimum payment. And as you can start knocking off mm-hmm. um, the, the, the the number of minimum payments, you can add more to your other. So if you can start, let's say you got two that are really small and mm-hmm. one that's really big, knock, knock those two out first and then really attack that bigger one. Okay, and again, our whole reason for doing it is not only getting out of debt, but we're trying to create cash flow so that we can start saving vehicles, which we're gonna talk in the next segment. Now, when I'm talking about sometimes, like you said, which one are you gonna do first? You need to look at both sides of the equation. Right. And I like to see what kind of cash flow I can develop almost from the get-go, if it's possible. Right. Now, when I'm thinking about this, I'm looking I'm looking at my savings accounts. You know, we talked about this in the last segment. The traditional thinking was 90 days. Now we're trying to create six months of savings, not yep. just 90 days, six months. And to your point, I think I'm looking at the new strategy of, Trying to buy, like you, you said, you bought your truck. I, it wasn't new. No. And we, so we're looking at new strategies all the time to see if we can buy. Well, maybe not an appreciating truck, but one that we've already down. It's already discounted, and we're paying a less price for it. Right. On depreciating assets, you want to pay as little as possible. Mm-hmm. You want to get the best value, okay? Mm-hmm. On appreciating assets, again, you want to you want to buy when it's low and, and you want to sell when it's high. Mm-hmm. Um, but another strategy for paying off debt would be, you know, just simply pay off more than the minimum. If the mm-hmm. minimum is 75 bucks mm-hmm. a month, send in 100, send in 150, send in 125. I think Dave Ramsey kind of came up with this thing called snowballing. And snowballing is a way that what you do is you pay you pay the minimums on most of them and you attack one of them. All right, mm-hmm. with with a lot extra, and you and you just pour extra money in there. Once that's done, you then move on to the next one, and you pay more on on that one. And so, what you're doing mm-hmm. is, as you pay them off, you're snowballing so that you got more and more and more of your assets focused on fewer and fewer debts. Now, the key is you got to stop using that credit card. Right. You can't pay off this one and then run one up over here. And unfortunately, that's what happens to a lot of people. They pay off this one, but they're running up this one. And then they pay this one. It's like kind of like whack-a-mole. You know, they're mm-hmm. trying to whack-a-mole. You've got to stop the spending. Well, there we'll are Reduce people, the spending. There are people that are into their personal Ponzi schemes. I mean, doing exactly what you just said. They pay this one down. That looks great. FICO score goes up for a few days. You know, a few months, and then they're back over on another card. And by the way, I kind of tell you, I cannot tell you all my life how many cards I get invited to join with every year. Oh, yeah. I, I shred them all. I all put right. those in the shredder. You, you know, I, look, I carry several credit cards. 
I pay the balance off mm -hmm. every single month. I never carry a balance mm -hmm. on a credit card. I pay it off every single month. Now, some people say you should cash out your savings. I would say you don't want to cash out all of your savings to pay off your credit card. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have excess savings, maybe you want to take some of it as earning 1% and you're paying 21% over here. It will work if you pay that off as long as you don't charge up a bunch more money. Mm -hmm. Some people have an emergency fund of six months and they say, well, look, if I took that and paid off a credit card, my credit card line of credit could be my emergency fund. That can work for some people. Like if, mm -hmm. if you've got adequate resources and you've got you know a house that's worth money and you've got 401ks, you've got other assets. Yeah, I've used lines of credit as my emergency money at some points, mm -hmm. but you've got to be very careful uh, about doing that. Well, what about this thing? I've heard, I've, seen talk, I've heard you talk about borrowing from, now most people have life insurance, maybe not cash value life insurance. But yeah. for people who do have cash value life, and life insurance, that interest rate's pretty low. Yeah, and you can borrow from your life insurance policy. You know, there's this whole thing out there, bank on yourself, you know, mm -hmm. bank on yourself.com. And what that is, is you just buy a bunch of whole life insurance and, and then you've got adequate resources that you can always borrow from mm -hmm. yourself. And that you don't ever have to go to a bank, you don't ever have to go to a credit card, uh, credit company, you can always just do it yourself with your with your life insurance policy. Because it's pretty low number. Hey, but, but what about borrowing from your 401k? I've heard traffic on this on the web, Yeah, good and bad on this. Well, look, you got to be very careful. I mean, certainly you can borrow from your 401k, and when you pay it back, you're paying it back into your account. But here's the problem. If you lose your job or if you retire, you stop working there, you got to pay that back, and mm -hmm. you got to pay it back really immediately. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a little bit of a time frame, but not much. You've got to pay that back, mm -hmm. and if you don't have the money to pay that back, that's a premature distribution, penalty, and taxable. And think about it. Some employers, if you leave the job to go to another job, right, they're going to not transfer it until you do pay it back. Right. You so have there's to, issues. You there's have issues. to pay it back, so you, that wouldn't be very... You'd have to be very careful. Well, now, I know a lot of people say, hey, I've seen a lot of cards come out and say, hey, listen, low interest rate for 90 days. Sometimes that could be an arbitrage way to pay down your debt if you really dedicate it for 90 days to play. What do you Absolutely. think Absolutely. You can, you can transfer to, a car, to another card, get a low interest rate for 60, 90, mm -hmm. 120 days. But again, are you going to be disciplined not mm -hmm. to start charging up somewhere else? See, the key is you want to get out of debt. You don't want to keep staying in debt. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, it all comes down to you have to spend less than you make. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. Right now, too many people are spending more than they make, mm -hmm. and you can't do that. You've always got to, I, my entire life, I've spent under what I made. Even when I was a second lieutenant in the Army, made $13,000 a year, I spent less than that, all right? And then with every pay raise, what I did was I took half my pay raise and I put it towards savings, mm -hmm. and then half the pay raise towards increasing my standard of living. And it worked out very well. I did it right out of the gate. Now, but, you know, I'm thinking... When we're talking about reducing debt, we have to be talking about creating a budget too. And so we're gonna spend a whole show on how to make a budget, create a budget. This is really something. But you said you said cut spending. I mean, everybody, like, I can't even get the government to give me a good example of this. They can't cut spending. Right. My state's not cu cutting right. spending. My county's not cutting spending. Everybody around me is just rolling up the tab, paying more on their interest charge. When we're talking about cutting, it's, it's tough. If you've had a certain lifestyle living off plastic, it's tough to migrate over to good budget habits. Talk to me about what would you cut spending first? What's one of the things you say, this would help you so much? It is not that hard. It is not that hard. Look, stop buying brand new cars. Go out and get a car that's a couple years old, 10, 10 12,000 miles on it. You get it for half price. If mm -hmm. you did that for the rest of your life, it's going to save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Stop buying so much clothes. You know, go to Goodwill. Go to these, there's these secondhand places for clothes that have brand new clothes. they never been worn. They still got the stickers on them, <laughs> but somebody bought them for, you know, $300 and they're selling them for $42. You know, go to mm -hmm. go to some discount stores, Ross Dress for Less, TGS, G, TGX Max, Steinmart. Look, these places have name brand brand clothes, but you're not paying mm. name brand prices. All right. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. it you know, mm. I think it's ridiculous when people are spending so much money on stuff that, that they don't even need. Well, remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, or a podcast, you can view our video version online at rightonthemoneyshow.com. And you can request information right from this segment. And in the fifth segment, we're going to go and talk about saving money with our cash flow that we just created with Tommy Hagnon. We'll be right back after the break. Shakespeare once said, this above all, to thine own self be true. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. It's difficult to make good decisions in life without knowing who you really are. And nowhere in life is this more important 
than making sound financial decisions. Creating a financial profile addressing your psychological disposition towards money is important, and that's a critical component in the decision-making process on saving, investing, and using insurance to protect against risk. Establishing your own risk tolerance is the first step in providing and building a financial profile so that you can measure your suitability for a financial product or a strategy. There may be many risk tolerance tests available to help you construct your own financial profile. One test that I use could be a good place for you to start. And I'll email it to you free and without obligation. The test will take about 10 minutes and you'll be able to calculate the results in the comfort and privacy of your own home. So just go to www.writeonthemoneyshow.com and click on the free risk tolerance test. Once you calculate the results, you'll have an understanding of your attitude towards money. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money and Happy New Year to you and yours. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about saving money from our cash flow with Tommy Hagen, a nationally recognized retirement speaker and best-selling author. Well, once we've created cash flow, Tommy, I'm ready to go. But I went out there, you know, I got my cash flow now, and I went to my bank, and I saw the one-year rate. I went out to, I said, forget my local bank. I went out to bankrate.com, hoping that it would be better with some place that doesn't have brick and mortar. And those rates for one year, three year, five year, Tom, they're terrible. Yeah, well, look, if, if you want short-term rates, they're going to be low. But there are other places you can invest your money. You can put it into your 401k. You can put it into a Roth IRA. You can put it into mutual funds. You can put it into annuities. There's a lot of different places you can put that cash flow. But a lot of people are wondering, you know, how, can I save when I'm when I'm still in debt? Should mm -hmm. I pay off the debt? Should I save? And there's, there's some different strategies mm -hmm. there. So here's some ways that you can save and get out of debt, mm -hmm. okay? The first thing you wanna do is you wanna list what all your debts are. Get get them all out. What are the debts? How much is it? What's the interest rates? What's mm -hmm. the minimum payments? You know, then you wanna figure out how much can you pay? And that's where you gotta cut that spending. We talk about it every mm -hmm. segment, but you gotta reduce your spending. And if you can work a part-time job for a while, I mean, that's there's nothing wrong with getting another job to help pay down your debt for a mm -hmm. while. Um, how much can you afford to pay? Set a debt-free date, have a goal. I wanna be debt-free by such and mm -hmm. such a date. Um, avoid using your credit cards while you're doing this. Try to minimize going into further debt. You want to keep a, a small cash cushion. You want to add to your 401k, especially if you're getting a match. I think that's mm -hmm. a big point. It is a huge. When you think about your 401k, people say, Steve, I have did some of the things you guys have talked about. I've got some free cash flow now. And I'm saying, are you maximizing, at least on your 401k, up to your employer's match? If you're doing that, this is a deduction in the hand. You're getting an extra money from your employer. And some people, I have to say, really, that is a great play to go. And I like the 401k because most of them now are contributions. So they're driven by you, the participant. Right. right. And whether the market goes up or down, you're adding money. And, and with that match, I just want to say this. If you're if you're taking up 4% of your pay and they're matching it with 4%, that's a 100% rate of return. And you're talking mm -hmm. about low interest rates. Don't give up that match. That would be a key thing that you want to keep doing, even when you're getting out of debt, because that's basically free money. And if you don't put the money in there, you're not going to get that, okay? Um, you can try to ne negotiate lower rates with some of the credit cards, and some of the places will work with you to mm -hmm. get lower rates. Sometimes you can take out a home equity loan uh, to, to move the debt over to home equity because home equity loans mm -hmm. are lower. But again, that's risky if you keep charging up other things. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you then pay that down, because some of that can some of that can actually be tax deductible debt, you know, mm -hmm. instead of taxable uh, debt. You 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 don't want to absorb all your raises into spending. So if you do get pay raises, if you do get promoted, mm -hmm. take some of that new money and put it towards paying off debt and mm -hmm. saving. You don't want to mm -hmm. spend it. Well, when you talk talked about home equity loan, I've heard you talk. We've been on the air before when you've talked about being careful how you use this, especially in right. retirement. Right. So. I think people sit there and say, well, you know, I have, and by the way, when you see consumer debt averaging between 30 and 40 grand, and we're not talking about your house, we're not talking about your right. car, if you're looking at 30, 40 grand, and then you go to your home equity and say, wow, I'm going to knock it down with that, and I have to be so disciplined not to go back to my plastic, right? right? I mean, right. so then I take out the home equity loan, and remember, I have to write checks about this. I, I'm, I'm not going to let that ride. 
So it can help the arbitrage between the interest rates in your cards and the interest rate charge in your home. It could be a great deal for you. It can if you're disciplined. Mm -hmm. You know, and it all comes down to that. You know, you've got to get your own personal habits under mm -hmm. control. And what happens is people just want it now and they want more mm -hmm. and they want this. And you just, that is that is a way to ruin. And if you if you can get your, mm -hmm. your habits under control, you can use some of these tools because that's mm -hmm. all any of these things are is tools mm -hmm. that can be used properly or they can be used improperly. But if you use them properly, it can help you. You know, Tommy, I want to ask you about this. A planned obsolescence, it seems like, I, it seems like I'm switching out iPhones every seven to eight months. So it's not even the day. It's like, oh, the newest thing. And somehow I can't live with the old iPhone. So I'm popping for the bigger screen, higher resolution, much more things in it. And I'm not just talking about games. I mean, really quality technology. Yeah. But it seems like it's either planned obsolescence or the technology is moving so fast, okay. I can't keep up with it. So do what I do. I don't get the brand new iPhone right away. I'm like one model behind it. Because mm -hmm. of that, I get it for less. And mm -hmm. I can live without the latest, greatest for you know 12 mm -hmm. months or 18 months because the technology today is so great. It's so much better than mm -hmm. it was five years ago that, you know, and same with golf clubs. You know, I, I go up and play golf with guys. They got the brand new golf club every year. I only buy a new golf club if it hits the ball farther or straighter than my current one. And mm -hmm. I won't spend the money if even if it looks nicer, even if I think, mm -hmm. oh, my buddies will say he's using a ping that's, you know, eight years old. I don't care if I can mm -hmm. hit it farther than them. I don't care. I want to hit the ball straight and mm -hmm. I'm, I don't buy new stuff just to have new stuff. Well, Tommy, I noticed that you, uh, on one of your lists that I've heard you talk about before, people come into money, maybe inheritance. Maybe they won the lotto, or some kind of tax windfall. refund, tax refund. Yeah. And they burn through. I mean. We're trying to use our money tastefully. We're trying to be good stewards of the economics that we have. So when I get a windfall, I should be looking at my debt reduction and then putting money into savings, not into consumer. Isn't it true? I mean, I just saw, we, we talked about this on another show where a person got a million dollar death benefit. They thought that was great. They're going to go out and spend, they're buying the new car and they thought yeah. they're going to live on the rest. Right. They're not going to live on the rest. No, in a 1% interest rate environment, a million dollars is $10,000 a year. You're not rich on $10,000 a year. Mm -hmm. People have no idea. Mm -hmm. And and they have no idea what they're going to need in retirement. They have no idea how much life insurance they need. They're mm -hmm. all underinsured because I think a million dollars is a lot. No, a million dollars is $10,000 a year. You need to have at least a million dollars of life insurance for every 50000 of income. People don't think that way. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to save up how many million for retirement if mm -hmm. we're in a 1% interest rate environment. People have no idea. And so they think that, you know, they, they come into 50000 or 100000 mm -hmm. that it's a lot of money. It's not a lot of money in today's economy. Mm -hmm. And what you got to do is you got to get out of debt so that once you're out of debt, you can supercharge your savings. Mm -hmm. See, we want to get out of debt so that we can take all the money that we were paying off debt and put that to pay ourselves. See, right now, people are working for their money. And what you want to do is have your money work for you. Mm -hmm. That's the key. You, you stop working for money. Start having your money work for you. And you can do it if you're wise, if you're disciplined, if you get out of debt. You can do it. Now, Tommy, I've been looking at, again, back to back, bankrate.com. I mean, for my short-term money, you know, if you're going in there for a year, you might get a point, point and a quarter, maybe, maybe, for a one-year CD. But I've also noticed that five-year annuities, deferred annuities, which a lot of our viewers uh, and, and listeners, they go, I'm not really sure I, I know about that. Some of those five years are paying 275 to three. Yeah, and I mean, you can even get into variable products that can pay more than that. Now, that's got risk, though. And, yes, but but they're but if you're, if you're an annuity, then they'd have guarantees against that risk. Mm -hmm. So so you've got to look at the whole package, or you can do what I do. 100% of my new purchases are going into deferred income. For retirement. I, yes, I'm locking in income because I've figured this out, Steve. My retirement is all about income. It's not about assets. I don't even care what the market does. I don't mm -hmm. care what my assets are. It's all about income. So I'm trying to load up with as much guaranteed lifetime income as I can. And I've got some starting at 60. I got some kicking in at 65. I got some kicking in at 70. I got some more kicking in at 75. And I buy them in a ladder to ensure I will have increasing income for the rest of my life. Well, that's that's kind of a new mantra because the old mantra, you know, buy term, invest the difference. You're kind of buy income and invest the difference. Yeah. I mean, it's all about income. And that buy term and invest the difference, that was a loser strategy from day one because what happened is buy, people bought term and they spent the difference mm -hmm. and they bought term and they lost the difference. Mm -hmm. Almost every one of those people would have been far better off, far better off if they would have bought a whole life or a you know some type of permanent life insurance policy. They would have far more cash today than what they do when they mm -hmm. buy term and invest the difference. And then they wind up in retirement with absolutely no life insurance. Mm -hmm. There's an entire generation that's going into retirement with no life insurance. Mm -hmm. They were told their house would be paid off. They'd have a pension. They, mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't need it anymore because they'd have so much money. Well, that, none of that's true. Mm -hmm. And that now they got no life insurance. And so now they live a just-in-case retirement mm -hmm. because 
they're denying themselves a retirement because they think they got to leave their kids some money. Well, when I think about the number one demographic for re- for actual life insurance sales is happening with the seniors. They're buying final right. expenses. Right. They're buying insurance for the first time. You know, and remember, we have to have health issues. Right. They got to protect against Social Security mm-hmm. benefits. They they want to leverage charitable giving. They want to help their grandchildren. Mm-hmm. I tell people, don't give your kids money. Leave them life insurance because mm-hmm. you can leave them so much more. Yeah. When we're thinking about putting money aside, we've created a cash flow. Now we're looking at our short term money. Maybe we're using a, a CD or we're trying to get six months out so that in case anything happens to our job, we have six months kind of a cushion before we ha- actually have problems. I'm also looking at, you know, a lot of us have HSA accounts from our medical accounts. I mean, there's money in there for medical and that could be a huge issue. And again, your match issue, man, if your client, if your employer is matching your 401k, you should at least put money up to the match. Cause you said that's free money and it's a hundred percent return if, if you did nothing else. Right. And then one last thing, Steve, that we could talk about to some future show is that, you know, there's not just diversification when you're investing money. There's tax diversification. Because, mm-hmm. see, you don't want to have all your money going into pre-tax. You don't want to have it all going into your 401k. You want to have some money going into some type of tax-free, like a Roth IRA mm-hmm. or permanent life insurance where you can pull money out tax-free. And that's a that's a whole nother show. Well, that's our show for this week. I want to thank Tommy Hagner for being my guest. But before I go, remember what the good Reverend John Wesley once said. Make all you can, give all you can, save all you can. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you next week right here on Right on the Money. For more information on this week's money topics, just go to our website at www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and follow Steve's daily postings on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. When it comes to retirement, money management, small business, insurance coverage, college funding, or budgeting, we have the interviews you can use.